Welcome to the Force Dex Metric Minute brought to you by Ball Performance. I'm Kareem Durkawi, and in this upcoming series, we will closely examine the counter movement jump and several of its key metrics. This information is intended to help practitioners better understand and leverage force plate test results. By the end of the series, we will have analyzed various movement strategies and explored training ideas, but we need to start with understanding a few key concepts. The first of which is eccentric peak velocity. Simply put, it's the maximum speed a person reaches while dropping down before a vertical jump. This power equation nicely summarizes the relationship between power, force, and velocity. Now from baseline, increasing velocity will naturally increase power. However, increasing downward velocity requires greater deceleration forces being put into the ground, thus increasing force as well. Therefore, increasing eccentric peak velocity will increase ground reaction forces, maximize elastic energy storage, and result in improved power and jump performance. We can use eccentric peak velocity to assess movement strategy and athlete readiness. Baseline testing easily determines an athlete's eccentric strategy and where improvements can be made. However, periodic testing may reveal changes in strategy when an individual moves significantly slower than previous tests. Common reasons for this include soreness, injury, or general dampening of the neuromuscular system due to fatigue or other factors. A simple take home message is that eccentric peak velocity is a key metric that sets the tone early for the entire jump and is used to evaluate or monitor athletes. For more information, have a look at bald.com, send us an email, or reach out to us on any social media platform. Thank you. The world of strength and conditioning is filled with some awesome practitioners who are always trying to evolve and continue to grow professionally throughout their career. The problem with many of us, though, is finding a new outlet, a new way and a new perspective on the questions that we may have, whether it be programming, whether it be situational with dealing with coaches, or whether it be career advice. Because all too often what happens is we get stuck in with the same group of friends and the same group of colleagues that we reach out to for advice repeatedly over and over again. But what we should really be looking for is different perspectives, different people who have been through different situations who can help us make better decisions both for ourselves and our athletes. And one awesome place to start with that is the forums in the Strength Coach Network. In the forums in the Strength Coach Network, you'll be able to reach out and get feedback, input, and advice from coaches from all over the world from everything from career advice to training modalities to programming, there's people there just for the same reason as you are, to try to get better, to learn, to share information, and to grow the field of strength and conditioning. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, that's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, to dive into all that great content today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. What's up, guys? C. Hayes here, in for this week's edition of My Thoughts Monday. Um, something I've been thinking about and, and talking about with some colleagues and, and other professionals recently, and, and I think it's been a big lesson for me um, through kind of the quarantine and, and this pandemic that we're going through in terms of training um, and, and the few kind of outdoor clients and athletes I've been able to work with through the, the period is just um, really the value of training variables and how to manipulate them, you know, when you don't have two, three, 400 pounds of, of barbell and plates to work with, or even, you know, 50 to 100 pounds of dumbbells to work with. Um, you know, the primary equipment that I've had, and, and I know it's probably more than a lot of people have been able to use through this time is two kettlebells, um, you know, a, a set of bands, a jump rope, a couple medicine balls and, and a viper. Um, which is obviously more than enough to get the job done, at least for the time being. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's really challenged me, obviously, to get outside the box, as it's probably challenged all of us to do so. And this is not, you know, let me say first, like this is not a barbells are overrated or strength is overrated. Like at the foundation of what we do as, as strength and performance coaches, of course, will always be strength, you know, and, and um, building that as the primary or one of the primary priorities first. But obviously at a time like this that we've, most of us have, have gone through without access to a gym um, over the past few months, I think it's really opened my eyes to what is most important, you know, outside of just building strength and what we can do as strength and performance coaches to uh, get more creative, you know, to challenge our, our athletes um, and, and any clients you know, in a, in a different way outside of just adding more weight 
um, you know, as, as we're obviously very used to in the past. And I think the biggest thing for me, the big kind of takeaway and, and, and lesson that I've learned is, and I've talked with a few people and, and gotten on social media about it, is like, I've never seen, you know, you'll never see whatever exercise, name the exercise, a, a Bulgarian split squat, a bench press, a, a front squat, a deadlift, right? I've never seen any of those exercises performed on a basketball court or a football field or a baseball diamond, uh, right? Because obviously you're not using equipment, right? But what is performed on those fields of play, court, et cetera, is movements, you know, positions, movements, angles, principles. Um, and so, sure, your athlete or, or my athlete, whatever, maybe they can bench press 200 pounds, deadlift, squat 300, 400 pounds. But how well, of course, and this is always, you know, that conversation we have about sport specificity and general physical preparation versus sport preparation. But like at what point, of course, you know, the, the million dollar question for us is at what point does strength no longer translate to the field or to the court? And I think for me, what's even more become more important and, and will continue to play more of a role in my thought process moving forward is not, OK, how strong can we get in terms of a two times body weight or, or yeah, two times body weight squat or two times body weight deadlift? Um, and I think those are fine metrics. And obviously there's literature to support it. Um, I don't think a trap bar is as valuable with that metric because of the shortened range of motion. And it's so concentrically driven. And we know, of course, how important eccentric, you know, components are to movement and to sport. Um, but that's, you know, that's not what this talk is about. But uh, as, as valuable as those metrics are and, and that literature is to support that, um, I'm not saying that it's not important. But for me, what, what I think moving forward is most important or one of the most important things is just teaching our athletes movements and positions, right? Can they dead, just because they can barbell or trap bar deadlift doesn't mean they can straight bar deadlift, right? Same movement hip hinge unless you know maybe you treat a trap bar like a squat pattern that's fine but just because they know how to hinge in one movement doesn't mean they necessarily know how to hinge in another movement or just because they can barbell bench press doesn't mean they can necessarily you know dumbbell bench press really well or shoot can just control their body weight in a push-up you know i've seen plenty of athletes be able to move pretty good weight on a bench and then have a huge anterior tilt lordosis curve lordotic curve on a push-up you know with no um, integrity, you know, uh, through their body, through the core, through the trunk. So um, really what I'm getting at here is just, you know, you know, I've had to do this. I'm sure we've all had to do this to some degree over the, the quarantine, the pandemic with limited equipment is challenging our athletes in, in different positions, it's the same movements, push, pull, you know, squat, hinge, bilateral, unilateral, uh, three dimensional planes, right? Sagittal, frontal, transverse, et cetera, anti-rotation, anti-extension. As long, in my opinion, as long as you're training those positions and those movements, um, that's what's most important, right? And in, in my opinion, I would argue to an extent, the more variability that you can provide with those positions and with those movements, the better prepared your athlete will be, right? Because getting back to that, like we never see X exercise on the playing field, obviously, but if they're prepared for that movement in that position and as many different variables and planes and, and, and ways possible, you know, from a concentric, eccentric, isometric standpoint, um, that, in my opinion, from a, just a tissue preparedness, tissue tolerance, fascial lines, et cetera, all those fancy things that we talk about, that I think is what helps them be most prepared. Um, and, and maybe not for performance, maybe the, a lot of the metrics we traditionally talk about are more performance driven versus, and that's where you maybe get more specific with your exercise selection and you really try to do, try to raise numbers in those areas um, versus the other end of the spectrum, I think, is, is just training for resilience and not injury prevention necessarily, right? But injury production, or excuse me, reduction, injury reduction. That I think is where the more variability you have, the better prepared your athlete will be. Um, and maybe that doesn't mean, you, you know, they're going to increase their vertical jump by five inches. Of course, if that's your number one goal or your number one KPI, then, hey, you got to train, yeah, sagittal, elasticity, one foot, two foot, et cetera, right? But if you're just preparing an athlete for the demands of their sport in as dynamic and comprehensive a fashion as possible, um, I think changing up, I'm not saying change your exercises every day. Of course not, right? We should still have plans and phases and programs and progressions. 
um, and regressions. But um, to some extent, I think the more variability that you can build in, the better. And something I've got to doing a lot, um, obviously, again, with load not being able to be the number one or primary factor being changed, is we might do a hip hinge series where every every set, if we're doing three or four sets, the position changes. Like the first set might be a, a standard, you know, hip width RDL or hip hinge. Second set might be a sumo or wide stance. Third set, a staggered stance, heel to toe, more, a little bit more of a, you know, unilateral split, unilateral load. And then if we're going to a fourth set, maybe that fourth set is a single leg, you know, a true single leg RDL or hip hinge. Now, of course, day one with an athlete, you're probably just doing bilateral. You're probably just teaching, you know, a regular hip width hinge. But as they progress, you know, if you have an advanced college guy or advanced pro guy or girl, um, that's where, you know, I think that variability can really come into play more and more. So um, I hope I, I covered what I was trying to get there. I know I, I said a lot and went in a few different directions, but um, hopefully that makes sense, guys. It's just kind of a, been a big takeaway for me um, in my programming, you know, through the past few months and something that I think will, will carry a strong influence moving forward. Um, whether it be with, you know, one-on-one athletes, clients, or, you know, in a team setting in the future. So, again, hope that made sense. Hope you guys get something from that. Please, you know, drop some feedback, comments, you know, DM, whatever. Um, would love to have a conversation about this further. And as always, thank you to Jay and, and CVAPS for the platform and, and look forward to, uh, to talking to you guys again soon. All right, thank you.